Hi, thanks for watching. We are always really excited to hear how God is using this ministry to touch lives, not only here in San Antonio, Texas, but also across the world. If that's you and you have a story to tell, we want to hear it. Please email your story to us at mystory at faith-outreach.org. And if you'd like to be a part of our ministry and support it financially, you can do so through our online giving. It is your continued support that makes it possible for us to reach people with the message of the kingdom. Please keep your mind and heart open to hear what God has for you today through this message. I want you to open your Bibles now to, uh, just go, let's go to the, to the book of Hebrews, first of all. The altar, uh, Hebrews chapter 1. The altar is where things are altered. Amen. It's at the A-L-T-A-R, where things are A-L-T-E-R-E-D. It's at the altar where things are altered. Altered is changed. God works a change in people. And he's working a change in you today. All right, so what, what we pointed out to you the last time in terms of this intimacy with God, shifting into a greater area of intimacy, and I want you to thank you, Holy Spirit, for helping your people understand this, that there is not just a going forth of a series of messages, but really a call from heaven to move the body, to move the body of Christ into a place, into a position in God where when the storm comes or whether the storm comes or does not come, that you are a people who stand as answers from heaven for a world that is reeling under the effects of disobedience. If I could, if I could have you picture the world as a person and, uh, and uh, the issues that are in the world as a burden on the back of that person, you would see that that person is exhausted and that his legs are shaking and sweat has soaked every bit of his clothing and it's just a moment before those, those burdens crush that person. Wow. But what God has you and I doing is according to Isaiah 10 and verse number 27, in that day shall his burden be removed from off thy back and his yoke from around thy neck and the yoke shall be destroyed because of the anointing. So God has placed his anointing in you and I as his people to go move, remove burdens, and destroy yokes. You are a sign of God to not only walk free yourself, but be a freeing agent. Yes. Yes. And so when God moves on the body to free the body of addictions or to, or to free the body of encumbrances, he is moving that off the body so that the body can be a blessing. A restored body goes forth to be a blessing. Right. He's doing a work in us in every way, in every way. Emotionally, to break burdens, to, to remove burdens, to destroy yokes. Physically, physical healing manifested, glory of God, walking in the body of Christ, being a light, being salt in the earth as he intended for us to be. Now, the way we get there is through this thing called intimacy. And there is a pathway of intimacy. I'll just say uh, to you briefly last week that we talked about it. God uses different things to craft an invitation for you, a crafted invitation for you to become intimate with him. He will often do it at his own promptings by dealing with some things in your spirit as he did in the case of Moses where we looked at Exodus chapter 3. He set a bush on fire. He crafted that as an invitation. And when Moses said, I will turn aside and go see, then God spoke to him. So God crafted an invitation to bring him closer. Now, God will even use what the devil intends to do for your harm as an invitation for you to come to know him. The enemy released a sickness or a disease or an ailment or trouble into your life with the full intent in John chapter 10, verse 10, to kill, steal, and destroy. But God looks upon that in the lives of his people and God says, I didn't send it, but I'm certainly going to use it. I'll use it as an invitation to call you further into myself. Hallelujah. And as you begin to walk with God through the midst of all of that, yes. you'll see that what the, you'll be able to say, you'll be able to say, as Joseph said, what you meant for evil, yes. God has done what? God has turned it around for good. 
This is why the devil is so defeated. Nothing he can cook up, nothing that he can orchestrate is beyond God's ability to use it to call you deeper into himself and to provide a way of escape out of what the enemy seeks to do. To make you a trophy of his grace in the process. So he crafts an invitation for you. And then when you express a compelling interest, if you're going to walk with God, it's because you're going to express a compelling interest to do so. And then a concrete investigation. You are, you are not afraid to ask the tough questions to God. Now, he may give you answers and may give you answers that you don't expect, and he may not give you any answer. But he doesn't want you timid about asking the question. Because it's in asking the question, dialoguing with him, that you come to know him, your level of intimacy with him increases. And he will do, he will take, he will undertake you and take you further into himself and cause you to know his will and purpose and his desire and his heart and your heart becoming his heart. All of that is a part of this dynamic that we experience as we move in closer intimacy with God. Concrete investigation. I want to know why. And the Bible says that he says in the book of Isaiah, God says to the nation of Israel, come let us reason together, saith the Lord. The invitation is to talk. The invitation is for you to have personal exchange with a holy and a righteous God. And as you begin to do that, as you begin to walk in this concrete investigation, something will begin to happen and we're going to explore that this morning uh, more fully than anything else. Something will begin to happen uh, in light of that called a critical identification, a crucial identification. You start to identify with him because you have come to understand that he is identified with you. Now, I ask you to turn to the book of Hebrews, did I not? Hebrews chapter number one. Uh, as I told you before, there are different methodologies in teaching. Some of it is expository teaching where passages uh, concentrated upon and truths are pulled out of that passage and, and uh, in, in so doing in that kind of teaching it becomes very important that context be developed and all those things so that you are able within uh, within a knowledge of that context to pull out so yeah this is this, our Bible teacher in the house gave a hearty amen because that's the way the word is approached in expository teaching Another type of teaching is uh, conceptual instruction. To teach a concept, you, you move a bit in Scripture, sometimes not staying in the same place. You move a bit in Scripture in order to pick up uh, similar points or similar circumstances to solidify a concept. And what I'm doing with you this morning is not the former of the two, but the latter of the two. We're doing a, a conceptual instruction especially where this thing of, cru of crucial identification is concerned. While you're walking on this road of intimacy with God, beloved, while you are taking steps to go deeper in your, in your relationship with God, in fact, uh, there, was a, there have been seasons in the history of the church where God will raise up people and their whole emphasis was to call the body of Christ into a deeper place with him. Their whole call, men like A.W. Tozer. Uh, some of you don't even know that name. But, but his, his call was to call the body of Christ deeper into a, a, an experience with him. E.W. Kenyon called people into a deeper experience with God. Oswald Chambers. Men and women of God, Madame Guillaume, if, if you don't have any of her stuff, most of it is out of print. But if you, ever, if you ever got a hold to any of her writings, her compulsion was to call the body of Christ deeper into God. Let's get beyond the surface. And I'm, I, I, what, I, what, I, what I perceive in my spirit is that in many cases, God is, is now refreshing that call. He's refreshing this, uh, this, this compulsion uh, to the body of Christ to come deeper into him, deeper into him, 
deeper into him, deeper into him, deeper into him. As we go deeper into God, then we know how to manage the things around us in the world. We know how to respond to them. We don't become isolated from them. We don't build mon monasteries and go inside them and, and keep everything away from the common man. No, we go deeper into God that we might be able to accurately answer the challenges that face us. Amen. That we might be able to look at the challenges of our day and answer from heaven. So there's this sense of this call now of, of this, on this walk with God for us to be able to more fully identify with Christ Jesus. Uh, you're in Hebrews chapter number one. And, uh, and I'll say, we're going to read in verse 14. And we're going to read down through verse 18. And we'll, we'll do some other passages. This, this matter of crucial identification. It's important that you understand that God is not, as in the case of many other religious forms, God is not an isolated being out there somewhere who is all-powerful and non-tolerant of the imperfect and orchestrates the, the goings-on of a, uh, of a lifetime to display his latent displeasure toward you by causing you to fall in one trap or another or to go through one test or trial of another, what, what people believe about God is some strange stuff. But God is your father. And, and having a desire for you to know him and for him and for your knowledge about him as it relates to your circumstances, he became, uh, he became like us. And there are certain things that, that is an advantage to us by God becoming like us. Uh, just let me, let me begin here in Hebrews. Several passages that I that I have on the in the pot to share with you this morning. I think I'll take the first dip out of Hebrews. Uh, it's chapter two, by the way. Hebrews chapter two. Hebrews chapter two. Hebrews chapter two, verse number fourteen. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same. That's powerful right there. For as much as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, you and I, humanity, we are comprised of certain particular parts. So while they're in Hebrews, just flip back to the book of 1 Thessalonians. 1 Thessalonians. And look with me in chapter 5. And verse number 23, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 23. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Somebody else got other than the King James right here? And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. Anybody else? It, NASB, what does it read? Entirely. Entirely. Another translation may say completely. That you, that God would set you apart completely. And then in the rest of the verse, he tells you who the complete person is. The complete person is the spirit, the soul, and the body. Now we must be able to say that if God became a man, then in the person of Jesus Christ, Jesus became everything man is. Now, you don't know it, but this is a raging argument. It has been down through church history. On the one hand, Arius, where we get a doctrine, a doctrine called Arianism from, 
that thing has been so degraded. Now, all you know about Arianism is the people with bald heads and hates every other race. But Arianism and Arian actually came out of a theological argument. And the opposers to Arianism put forth this, this thought. Christ is a redeemer of all mankind. Therefore, what Christ did not become, he cannot redeem. He had to become totally man in order to redeem man. Now, folks, listen. There have been councils that have taken place in, in the church where the leaders of the church came together to try to decide who Christ was. It's happened historically. Who is this person, Jesus? Some says that he came and he, and out of, out of a passage in Philippians, um, go there, Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2, beginning at verse number 5. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took on him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. Now, a lack of pr proper uh, exegesis on some of those words, uh, that, that is, a lack of proper study and rightly dividing the meaning of certain words, caused people to go in a direction theologically that gave them the sense that Christ was not fully man. He just looked like him. See, he, he took on the likeness of men. He wasn't act, actually man. He just took on the likeness of him. Well, the Hebrew writer made it plainer. He says, just as the children were partakers of flesh and blood, Christ himself partook of the same. So if a man is spirit, soul, and body, then Christ must also be identified as, a, as one having spirit, soul, and body. I'll just take you to three flashpoints so we can move on a little quicker. In Luke chapter 23, I think around verse 46, he's on the cross here, and he's dying. And in one of the seven statements he makes from the cross is, Father, into your hands... I commend my spirit. So he articulates that as a being on earth, he has a spirit. Because humans are made entirely or completely of what? Spirit, soul, and body. Now, if we'll back up a little bit from the cross and go to the Garden of Gethsemane, we will hear Jesus praying. And he prays and says, my soul is sorrowful, yeah. even unto death. So on the cross, he identifies that like all other humans, he too has a human spirit. And in the garden, he recognizes a soul and a soul that has the capacity to express emotion. And of course, if you look a little bit further back from the garden scene and go with me to the Last Supper, he's taking bread and he's break the, he broke the bread and said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. God became completely a man while at the same time remaining completely God. Why? Did he need to do that for his sake? No, he did it so that you and I might completely identify with him and to know that he has completely identified with us. So go back to Hebrews with me now. Are you all right so far? Yes. Hebrews 
uh, chapter 2, verse, verse 14. There was a reason that he became, oh God. There was a reason they became completely man. Here it is right here. He also likewise partook the same that he through death might destroy him that had the power of death. That is the devil. Now he became a man so he could face man's master. He became a man so that he could face man's master. Man had yielded up his sovereignty. In the Garden of Eden, he yielded his sovereignty up. And Paul picks up the notion in Romans, and he says in Romans, the fifth chapter, verse number 12, for by man came sin. For by one man, sin entered into the world and death by sin. So man opens the door to these, what I call the ugly twins, sin and death, and they marched into the human race and killed everything. Now, if man's going to be redeemed from that, a man... had to come and for the purpose of facing him that had the power over these diabolical twins, take his most severe blow, death itself, in order to free man from the captivity and the mastery and the fear of death. Yeah. Jesus has come. Hallelujah. And he has destroyed him that has the power of the death, that is the devil. So now in Christ Jesus, we no longer fear death. We no longer fear death. Because Jesus has defeated death for us. And then he went on to talk some language like this. You will call it in, in, his, in his prayer, uh, 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 he, he says some strange stuff. He said things like, he that believeth in me, and this is at, at the raising of Lazarus, he that believeth in me shall never die. Shall never die. And he that believeth in me, uh, if you're dead, you're going to live. Why? Because I have conquered death. Death no longer has a hold over you. So, so the, the, the notion of crucial identification has for us to see that the God of heaven became every whit a man, spirit, soul, and body. And as a man, go back with me to Hebrews now. As a man, he has suffered death to deliver us from it. And in chapter 4 of Hebrews, beginning at verse number 14, seeing that we, are, seeing that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our profession or confession, same word, for we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but was in how many points? All points. In all points, yep. tempted like as we are, yes. yet without sin. Thank God for the last three words, yet yes. without sin. Yes. He was tempted just like we're tempted. Yes. And yet didn't sin in them so that when we are tempted, we know that he has the power to walk us out of this temptation and to give us victory over it. Now, those rest of those gods that are served by people uh, 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 of the nation, they're not really gods, they're just demons, right. demon spirits, yeah, right, right. that they render flowers and animal sacrifices and all, kind, all of the kind of a picture and a, 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 a diminishing picture of a relic they have about the truth. Right. 
But God is calling you and me to recognize that he has come in every way have become human and can be touched with the feeling of our infirmity. I don't know how many of you have recognized, but Jesus was tempted with drugs. Come on up. In a place of his pain, he was tempted with drugs. And they put the reed to his mouth and he wouldn't take it. In the place of his pain. And many people who use drugs, whether it's alcohol or drugs, they're really trying to anesthetize pain. They're trying to get past a a moment of pain. But Jesus in his pain knows what it's like to be tempted to try to move away from that pain and and, and with a substance and somehow bear through the moment, but he didn't. Therefore, he's able to walk with you through that and completely and totally deliver you and bring you into soundness and wholeness and wellness by the work and the power of the Holy Ghost. He was tempted with sex, sexuality, and the Bible says that, that the women ministered unto him out of their substance. He was a carpenter. After 30 years of doing that, no doubt has some physical effect on him. And the women came, and, and women are not always tra- attracted to the bronze Adonis. Sometimes they're attracted to the little weasel guy. But I don't understand that, but they are. And <laughs> That's a whole nother subject right there. <laughs> but, but sometimes what attracts the, 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 the female is not the physical appearance but it's his ability to command and have authority and comfort and to speak peacefully and be at calm when everything else is around him. She identifies, she looks at him and sees there is something more attractive than his physicality. There is something more attractive than his physical person. It's his ability to walk calm in the midst of stuff. What if you had a big old bronze Adonis guy and every time something came along, he ran down behind the table and said, start biting on his fingernails. Y'all pray for me. Just pray for me. Pray for me. (laughs) There is a certain calm that Jesus had. It was attractive. Jesus was immensely attractive. Bishop uh, Williams said again uh, in in, in some sit-downs with him, he said, Uh, Because he spent a lot of time away from his wife and and his family. And I asked him, the the book is not a surface book. I asked him, how did you you avoid temptation? All of those times away from your wife at many long periods of time. He says, first thing, uh, Helda, this this heavy Jamaican accent, where there's an E at the start of the word, they put an H there. So elder is helder. First thing helder is I left her clean. I'm coming back clean. I left her uncontaminated. I'm coming back to her uncontaminated. And, And he said to me, listen, what preachers need to understand is that women that are attracted to them are not really attracted to them. That's right. There you go. She on. said they, they often are attracted to the anointing. So you think about it. Before God put, plays his hand on you and anointed you to do something, women weren't giving you the time of day. Right. And you're the same guy you always were. 
They had no affection, no, didn't turn in that direction, in your direction at all. But when the anointing of God comes on you and you begin to move things and shake things, they're now attracted to that anointing. And then he said, take a look at this. After men have fallen under the sway of women and that anointing is gone, the woman leaves too. Vamanos, somebody said. So understand, oftentimes it's the anointing. And you have to protect that anointing. Come on, somebody. So Jesus was tempted in every way. Tempted with drugs, tempted sexually. The Bible, did the Bible say all points? Does all points mean all points? Yet without sin. So he calls you and I into this place of intimacy to be identified with him so that we would know that he lived life just like we lived it. He drew this thing to my attention. It's a little slight thing, but it, but it, but it wasn't slight for me. It might not be slight for you. That Jesus in his ministry pursuits, he got tired. And the Bible says he was going through Samaria and he sat on the well at Sychar because he was tired. So Jesus didn't just fold his hands and kind of glide down the streets of Galilee. He just, hmm, what a nice, hmm. No, he was human. So that you and I might know that he knows what it feels like when the burden of ministry is on your shoulder. Not just this kind of five-fold ministry, but the ministry assignment where you have been individually called. When it gets burdensome to you, he knows what that feels like. Now, one more point of identification is in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse number 21. Happening on the cross, he walks a sinless life out. And, and yet on the cross, he has another point of identification to take with us. It's mind-boggling to me, charisma. It's mind-boggling to me. That 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For he, God, made him, Jesus, to be made sin. That even... In my sin, he has identified with me. Yes. It made him to be sin for us that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. So he took on my sin so that I could take on his righteousness. It puzzles me. But it's an identification. It's a point of identification. He took my sin on him. He became chargeable with every, every uh, transgression that I have ever committed in the presence and the sight of God. My loving Jesus became sin for me. And having become sin for me, he was judged. The wages of sin is death. death. Having taken on my sin, he also received my judgment. My judgment for my sin didn't change because Jesus took it on. My judgment for my sin did not change simply because Jesus took it on himself. No, he took my sin on himself and he took my judgment on himself too. Glory be to God. I love, I love. I love you, Jesus. Greater love hath no man than this, 
than he that would lay down his life for his friend. This is what creates intimacy is this notion of crucial identification. He has come, he's become a man totally spirit, soul, and body. He has been tempted with my temptations. He knows what my infirmities feel like. He took my sin on himself and bore the punishment of my sin on himself. That's one side of the coin. The other side is that I might identify with him. Because Ephesians 2 says that when you were dead in trespasses and sins, that God quickened him, quickened us together with him and raised us. (laughs) Raised us up together. So as much as I identify with his humanity, his becoming humane, and as much as I identify with his knowing my infirmities and weaknesses, as much as I identify with him taking on my sin and the penalty for it, I must also recognize that I am now identified with him in resurrection, that the resurrection life of Jesus is now living on the inside of me, and no more can death have any sway over me than it could have over him. He's raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. I can identify with him in righteousness now. Not by any works of righteousness which we have done, but God through his grace has saved us, and he has made me just as righteous as Jesus in his sight. And now the same power that's in me, that's in Jesus, also dwells in me. Romans at chapter 8, verse 11. It says, if the spirit of him that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal body. The spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwells in your mortal body. Identification is crucial. I know, I know him in whom I have believed. When you walk out of this place today, you walk out of this place with the capacity to fully identify with Jesus, not on just one side of the coin, but on both. I'll just tell you that, that many religions stop at one side of the coin. They stop with you identifying with him in his humanity. Or him identifying with you. They cease to to identify with him in his resurrection. But my relationship of intimacy with Jesus is on both parts. What, 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 What it does is that when I fail under my infirmities, it doesn't cause me to run away from God. Because I know he identifies with me in my infirmity. So my weakness causes me to run to him. You know what this feels like. And I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I fell under the weaknesses of my flesh. I'm sorry for it. And I begin to identify with him in the spirit. I thank you also that not only uh, uh, have you forgiven me because 1 John 1, 9 says you would, if I confess my sin, you're faithful and just forgive me of my sin and cleanse me from all unrighteousness. But now you also have raised me up. You've given me the power over sin. And I confess I have authority over sin. Teach me to walk in that strength day after day after day. And when I'm faced with whatever it is, God, give me the grace to walk in authority over it. As you walk like that, your intimacy with God grows. And this is the intimacy that you're going to need in days to come. Not a surface, but a firm relationship with Jesus that keeps you walking upright before him. Stand on your feet, please. (laughs) 
I'm going to hang around uh, continual investment next Sunday. And then really submitting your will to God. Walking with God, working with God, and waiting on God. We're going to talk about that next Sunday. Submit your will to him, walk with him, work with him, and wait on him. Because it dovetails off of this continual investment. If you're going to grow in a relationship with a person, it's going to be because you're going to make continual investment in that relationship. You stop making investment, it dies. Are you listening to me? You got to be intimate. You got to be, I said to a group of of college age and high school kids, uh, listen, you got to go further than your parents went. You got to know more about God than your parents knew. You have to come in connection with him in a real way that they, that was just some stuff they didn't know. And if you and I will look back on our own childhood experiences with God, our parents walked in the light they had, but there was some light they just simply didn't have. And every preceding generation must grow stronger and fuller and deeper in intimacy with God. So when we talk about you've got the time listening to God's word, when we talk about Pray 1K coming together to put a a, a thousand hours collectively of prayer together between now and Passover, listen, it's not just not some busy program. It is done with intent to cause your intimate walk with God to increase.